Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call to order the June 8th, 2021 meeting of the Dinah Parks and Recreation Commission. Janet, if you could do the roll call, please. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Nelson? Here. Commissioner Willett? Here. Commissioner McCauley? Here. Commissioner Good? Here. Commissioner Haas? Here. Commissioner Itis? Here. Here. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion and a second for item number three, the approval of the meeting agenda, please. So moved. Second. Janet, do you do roll call again then? Sure. Who, who moved? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Corin. Corin, thank I'll you. See. And Brian seconded? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Nelson? Uh, aye. Commissioner Willette? Aye. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Haas? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. Thank you. Um, to item four, I'll ask for a motion and a second for the approval of the uh, meeting minutes from, I got to look at what day of May, probably. So April 13th. Uh, Thank just you. Chair Artis, we have two sets of minutes on oh, your agenda tonight. Yeah. Uh, the first is from April first 13th was, meeting and then right. May 12th meeting. Yeah, so May 12th. Both, right? Somebody made the motion. Yes. Yeah, so moved. Second. Uh, Janet, please. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Willett? Aye. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Haas? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. Okay. Uh, item 5. 5A, 2021 work plan discussion, and I'll let Director Vetter start. Can I just ask Thank a you, question? Uh, Go ahead, sorry. Question, so was, that was for both of the minutes? The one motion was for both of them, right? Okay, I just didn't catch yes. that part, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members of the commission. Um, just before we begin, I just wanted to remind anyone watching that we are meeting uh, remotely in compliance with uh, Governor Wall's executive order. Um, we ask you when possible to mute your microphone to prevent feedback. Um, if you are able to, please leave your, your cameras on unless you're having bandwidth issues. And as always, we will call roll for each motion um, that you have this evening. So thank you for, for attending this evening. Uh, tonight, we have your uh, work plan on for discussion um, to provide any updates to the commission, any additional discussion. Um, Chair, I guess I had in the notes if you wanted to do any debrief from the joint work session that you just had with the Edina City Council, that would also be an appropriate time to talk about that. Um, after we can get any updates to the existing work plan, any any progress that was made, we would also then entertain after that. Um, the beginning of the discussion on the 2022 work plan. So while you haven't finished 21, you're still working on that, start generating ideas on 22. Um, as always, um, I'll start off as the, the first initiative um, remains at the staff level. Uh, last month, I did provide a, a quick update of something that staff is working on. Um, on June 1st, the city council did authorize staff to join the Just Deeds program um, that would be um, an effort to uh, remove racial covenants that, that property owners may have on their existing home deeds. So that program um, was um, accepted to, to enter by the Edina City Council. There's a, a, a second part of that, and that's the one that um, a lot of Parks and Recreation staff is working on, and that's identifying the racial covenants that are on city-owned um, primarily park properties. So that effort is, is underway and ongoing. Um, 
the June 15th, Edina City Council will have additional information on the, the removal and process of those racial covenants. We hope um, the, the council might be able in a position to take action on a bunch of those removals on that evening. And we will keep you informed of that progress. Um, again, this is a, a primarily um, ceremonial, but very important step um, to remove those covenants. They are non-enforceable um, on people's private property and especially on, on city property. However, it is very symbolic that we do remove those. In regards to the, the current initiative of um, identifying barriers for participation and try to reach communities of color, um, the race and equity coordinator, Heidi Lee and I met with one of our, our peer cities who had started this effort several months before us. And we've kind of gotten the, the framework of the approach that they are using. Um, so hopefully soon we can switch gears off of just deeds back onto this program. But in essence, we'll really need to um, rely on the commission to help us um, try to identify um, folks that are that feel that they have a low engagement in our park system and they feel that they have a low influence on our park system. As you know, and you hear from a lot, we have a lot of people that feel highly engaged in our park system and highly influential in our park system. So looking at kind of a different of a, a quad matrix, if you will, if we can start identifying communities within that area and then to approach continued conversations with outreach and feedback. Um, this city that we met with is actually um, possibly using intermediary or a third party to reach that, to expand levels of trust on um, why there's a lack of participation, what would interest people more, is it um, what are offer, what activities or programs are offered, is it is fee a basis, is transportation a barrier? So really trying to get uh, uh, out into the community and build trust with groups to get that sort of feedback. So um, just wanted to let you know that we did make some progress on that, even though um, majority of the staff and the, the current workload is on the just deeds. So um, hope to have a, a greater update and something for Commissioners Struther, Miller and McCauley to review over the next couple of weeks. That's the initiative one update um, which is currently at the staff level be eventually at the commission level and we can continue on from there chair um, initiative two uh corin please hi so we did share this out with them in our in our joint session with the council um there wasn't a ton of feedback um either way but i think that they were all on board that this was a a good way of going about trying to share the message out, um, especially in the current situation, um, given the the COVID obstacles that are currently in place. Um, we have not moved forward in terms of actually creating the content yet, but we have we have determined what the actual um, content will be. As I shared at last meeting, um, we just need to create the actual material and then figure out how we work in the communications team to actually. Um, go from the, creating the content, making it pretty and um, postable. Are there any questions on that? Any any idea when we might get together next, you think? Or? I think we can go ahead and schedule. I just think we need to really understand from the communications team what um, format we need to be able to get it from. So maybe, is there a person, Perry, that we should include from that? Because we can brainstorm all we want to, and we've already kind of said what we, what we think the topics would be, but. What do you, um, who should we include on there to make sure we're creating the content um, correctly before we create and recreate? Yeah, uh, if you would like to provide maybe some options for meeting times, I can see if any of those match up to our communications liaison, Caitlin Galt. Um, Caitlin uh, is in our communications division, but is the parks and recreation liaison on those types of activities. And I know a few of you know Jennifer Benarat. She's the director of that area, so she works for Jennifer. Um, and if that would work, we could connect up to that. Um, maybe Caitlin would want to bring Jennifer along as well because they manage the town talk format and have some criteria there. So um, okay. if we wanted to do that, 
condition, I know we kind of talked about divvying up the staff pieces for your focus areas um, between Tom, Tracy, and myself. Um, and if we wanted to do any further work on that, let us know as well. Things got really busy really quick over the last two weeks for us um, with, with programming kicking off. So anytime you can let us know like availability and we could try to match up, that would be great. Yeah, and I think that um, you are also gonna send a communication to each of those people saying, um, for example, mine was Tom, that, hey Tom, you and Corinne should go ahead and connect or do you want me to go ahead and do it? Cause you were gonna send those communications and I didn't see those come through. So do you want us to go ahead and just go ahead and create kind of okay. your own? Yeah, I, I apologize for that. I thought I did send those. Um, I mean, I, so. I, get my, so I, I, I mean, I have this email from before, so I can go ahead and reach out. I just didn't want to overstep my, my boundaries either. So um, if we can all okay. connect with those people and bring them into loop, maybe they can try to get, create a meeting with those four groups as well as the four staff, if possible, as well as Caitlin or Jennifer. Okay. Yeah, I will, I'll, I will get I'll, that. I'll look through and I'll re-update that and, and resend it if I didn't already, but we'll, we'll take care of that. You're going to send an email to me and Tom and then um, Greg and whomever and then Brian and whomever. And um, I think actually Rick actually did meet with his budget person, but um, that would be, if that would be helpful, that'd be great. And I also actually try to figure out some dates that would work for everyone. Um, so I will take that as a to-do still. So. Thank you. And if there's a way you wanted to find something that maybe was a standing time, we could work on that too, whether it be every, um, you know, every three weeks or something like that. If it works at a convenient time, we could keep it on the schedule. But I'll, I'll re-up that, that communication connection email to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Corin. Um, Initiative three, Eileen, please. Yeah, um, as uh, Cora mentioned, we met with the city council um, and I updated them from our last meeting that we had a menu of options to look at for alternative funding and everyone on that, on this uh, third work initiative had been assigned some research projects on three or four of the uh, menu items. And we would be following up with them in September, October time frame and time for the budgeting process um, so that they could make decisions uh, if if it connected to that. So um, I'll be trying to get another meeting set up for next week. I'll send everyone an email. And if you have any updates on what you were uh, agreed to research, uh, please send them to me. Um, that would be great. And uh, we we'll probably should have a meeting at least twice a month between now and September, October time frame. That group. Uh, know, one, one of, uh, we'll know more about the local option sales tax, um, I think, at the end of this month, possibly in July, but uh, it's obviously going to go to the special session. So we, we don't have any feedback on that yet. Just an update that our, our legis the legislation is in both the House and the Senate's tax bill. I think, as we all know, we aren't quite sure what the final tax bill will look like, but. Leading up to overtime, we were in good position. Hopefully that continues. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner McCauley, let me know if you need that grid, the draft grid sent out to anyone again, or if everyone has it. You mean of which enterprises for which menu item, that type of thing, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Very Rick, good, thanks, Eileen. Okay. No, I was just gonna say something about uh, uh, you know, perhaps with some of the financial wherewithal, if we were going to include the director in your next meeting, or should we just have one ourselves first? Um, I mean, uh, Perry's welcome to be at any meeting if he wants to. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make it. I wasn't, it wasn't a leading question. It's, you know, maybe it'd be just better for us to have our, you know, so we reacquaint with with what we're trying to do, and then because I know I need to talk to Perry about some of my items for sure. Okay. Um, um, 
Uh, thanks, Eileen. I think I know where uh, to find initiative when he needs me. So cool. yeah, yeah. We just we just need to overlay a part of my schedule, or we could just have it there. We could have tag along, so to speak. If anybody knows what that means. Um, initiative four and five, since Matt is not here, um, our previous chairman can do both of these in one setting. Right? Yeah, one, one setting with a quick recap. Um, no, <laughs> no particular progress on, on either of the two. Uh, Matt and I and the team have not met again on initiative number four. Um, and in initiative number five, we had a, a draft of our nine targeted benchmarks uh, that we shared with the city council in our work session, uh, with the exception of, uh, of uh, council member Pierce asking for an example of a few of them, didn't get any particular feedback uh, there or after on any concerns. So I think those are the nine that we'll continue to move forward with. Uh, some of them, Perry will have to engage uh, someone on staff potentially to some that are more financially oriented just to make sure that we we capture them well so that they're useful for the department. Um, and, but otherwise, we'll start to measure those over the next uh, several months and and just uh, see if we can establish ourselves a baseline that we can use in the future. Uh, good. Uh, thanks, and, Greg. And just to note, I did get a, a note from Matt, uh, Commissioner Doskoch, who's not able to be here tonight to set up a meeting with him. Um, to go over some of the questions he had on initiative four. Okay, good. Um, thanks again, Greg. Yep. Um, I fast forwarded into the upcoming uh, meetings and schedule. Can you, uh, Director, um, July 1st is another due date for us. Can you kind of uh, refresh us to where we should be at in terms of uh, that? Should we have more more meetings or more substance or? Yeah, I go back to uh, Chair Itis. Um, I think you you got some head nods on the the joint session when you talked about initiatives two and three kind of being the, the the tier one priority of accomplishing um you know not a lot of feedback on that which is consistent i think which with the message that you've gotten from the city council prior is that these types of things the reconnecting and alternative funding are extremely important right now so i think um for a july one update we could do exactly what we did after the first quarter um, based on your feedback and responses this evening. I could put a summary together, share that out for editing to see each lead could, could look at their item and say, this is exactly where we've made that progress to. And then we could put it into that July 1 update. Um, I could send that directly to the leads, get that feedback. And um, that eventually then goes to the city council. Again, they're just looking at um, what is the latest, what is that progress? Rather than seeing it once at the end of the year, they're seeing incremental progress four times a year. Okay, very good. That would be uh, that'd be good. Um, any comments from anybody on the initiatives, either theirs or someone else's? Uh, if not, we can move to item B. The twenty-two twenty twenty-two work plan. Thank you, Chair. Just again, an introduction. This is a, a tough transition when you've got um, a lot of big milestone work ahead of you yet for the remainder of the year. However, um, this is the time when you get to um, sit back and project where you think the, the commission will want to spend its time in 2022. Uh, MJ Lamone um, last month gave you a, a brief update on that work plan process. Um, that is included again in your summary. I should have put a warning on so you didn't print the packet because you've had, you'd have two of, of the same report from month to month, but um, just an observation of that calendar, June, July, and August, that's the time to, to really sit down and 
work on where you want those initiatives to be in 2022. Um, by August, we would look for a recommendation to, to have consensus with the commission on putting that plan together. Um, that will get um, summarized for the city council and Chair Itis will present that plan in October um, to the commission um, for, for consideration. They'll most likely have questions, comments. Um, Commissioner Good and Commissioner Itis, I believe you've both done this before. Um, Commissioner Good, I think you were in person. Commissioner Itis, uh, Chair Itis was not in person. So it's always easier in person. I would imagine we will be definitely in person by then. Again, that would then be for the 2022 season. So as uh, Commissioner Good kind of pointed out last week, this is the time to, to reflect on that, put together initiatives and ideas of um, community good. Um, you talked about are there large scale items that um, would assist the Parks and Recreation Department, those types of things. So beginning that discussion now, generation of ideas, maybe have a more detailed and in-depth discussion in July and then finalize that in August would be appropriate to develop the 2022 plan. Um, just my personal opinion, I think uh, items two and three from this year will probably be important to uh, remain on the work plan for 2022. I think those two will be ongoing into next year, especially with the ballot initiative coming up on the uh, sales tax. Just also generate, we did include in your packet this evening, just the parks open space and um, enterprise plan from the comprehensive guide chapter um, or parks open space and natural resources chapter, um, which does have some highlights and goals in it. Um, so again, this is more of that. You don't have a, a large deliverable this evening, but time to just generate ideas and, and talk about where you want to head. I can say something that I'd like to uh, discuss, uh, hopefully next year or the year after, uh, based on my own experience um, in accessing our parks in certain parts of the city. And I think the comments been made a couple of times here um, about people that are living kind of in the Southdale area who can almost see Roslyn Park and the lakes from their from their condos, but they don't know how to get there. They don't have good access to some of these community parks um, so i think having a discussion about how we increase accessibility um, it could be in some places signage it could be some places having discussions with our planning and transportation committees about how to um, make it possible to access some of these um, community parks um, other than trying to navigate via car to get there. Um, a lot of our residents can drive, don't wanna drive. Um, so if we can help the community start identifying ways now to plan for future infra infrastructure um, to make all these parks more accessible, especially in some of these areas where we have some very big, it's, where I live over here in the Southdale area, it's, we kind of have this big thing called France Avenue that kind of cuts us off from a lot of things. Um, I'm able to walk across it quite easily. Um, and I know that's a bigger discussion that we'd have to have with lots of different um, engineering staff members um, on how we address that you know, in the coming years. Um, but identify some of these things that we could start you know, putting on the map to be included in future infrastructure projects so that we can you know, keep people um, connected to their parks. Um, and maybe a, kind of an offshoot of yeah. that is maybe some wayfinding um, or better signage around the community where we do have lots of parks. Uh, I notice this, I walk Centennial Lakes a lot, but I don't see any signage to tell me that Edinburgh Park is right up the hill and here's an easy way to get up there or back and forth. Um, and that's just you know, one example that I come across. Um, so again, yeah. Kind of a bigger picture that needs to be refined a lot, but how do we keep people connected to their parks and make it easy for them to access to them? So, 
<clears throat> yeah, building off of that, Brian, as maybe something you could think about too is whether there's a way that we could use the clover ride out of the kind of the Southdale area as a stepping stone to do something similar that might route through some of our major parks, right? Then I think the clover ride, unless it's been uh, amended and expanded, I think that's still just a one day a week. Um, I don't know, Perry, if you know that off the top of your head, but it might be interesting to see if we could do something like that on an electric bus option that gets to some of our major parks from uh, Edinburgh to Centennial to Roslyn to elsewhere that allows people to understand there's another way to get to those parks if they can't walk or drive there themselves. For sure, good. I did not know the answer, so I looked it up. It's 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Fridays. You're correct. Still one day a week. Okay. Maybe maybe just one easy way to start that would be to see if the Clover Ride could even just hit Roslyn Park. If there were people that wanted to go from the Southdale area and get out and walk around Roslyn or uh, go to the Aquatic Center and then get back on the bus and go back to where they're headed, it might be an easy way to just expand that without too much hassle. Maybe they go play pickleball. You know, you know. Right. You know, it's, it was on the... Um... It was on our work plan a few years ago. I don't remember how many years ago, but we talked about actually that exact thing, same thing you're talking about, Brian, of the wayfinding, um, of creating some form of a um, map system, even if it says, like, hey, I'm right here. How do I get to the closest park? Some form of signage. And um, um, so I don't know if there's any park dedication fees that um, are looking for homes because it would be something, you know, actually use across multiple parks, which is kind of what park dedication is there for. That we could utilize from some form of signage perspective, um, where I think that, that in the past um, it wasn't always um, to be able to do that. So I didn't know if that was something that would be. Um, I don't know if there was for park dedication, but that would be something that we could look at. Um, that we've looked at in the past, but if we had new funding, my phone is be my computer's my Wi-Fi is being weird. So I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I can't see myself anymore. So maybe you can't we, hear me. We we can hear you. We just can't see you. Yeah. Oh, okay. At least you can see me. At least you can hear me. Yep. But I think the past, we did talk about wayfinding in the past, and we end up using the money for signs at the parks. So if it's something that we can actually um, look at again, I think it would be helpful. Because I do think it's, I do, I do think people don't know about where all the parks are because they just aren't aware. And it would be helpful. And that would be something we could kind of connect back to our education of, you know, we could tell people how to find the parks if they were actually there. And I know at one point, Perry, we had some money left over in that sign budget. I don't know if that's been fully utilized or if there's a if there's a small little fund sitting in your bottom drawer still somewhere that allows us to do something else with wayfinding signs. Let's give a quick update on that. Uh, commissioners are correct. There was kind of a two phase project of that. One was to do the monument signs at every park that was initiated and done. So that was the new. Um, entrance signs at all the parks. The second phase was a wayfinding uh, rules and regulations trail system, a, a really nice branded set of, of park signage. Um, that one was, um, those funds were reallocated for the budget stabilization fund during COVID. So that helped get through some of those projects. So that will be something we will have to reallocate funds to, um, maybe pending additional self-dale development and there is a generation of park dedication fees that could be an option um, so that we have a good plan set a good idea of what we need to do it would just need need funding to execute um, in addition commissioner Haas you mentioned something about accessibility to parks and I go back to uh, our initiative five commissioner good it was on when we first started talking about the um, where parks are and how they are. We right. we decided to kind of look at quadrants at that time for the, the initiative five, but we also discussed a little bit of a theory of actually looking at park service areas. And exactly to Commissioner Haas's point of, you may be right across the street from a park, but if your barrier is cross town or it's France Avenue, you may not feel that that is a welcoming place to go because of those infrastructure barriers. So while 
we do say everyone's within a mile of a park, it may not be reality that that, that actually is a service radius for those set of residents or those set of patrons. So that might be a, an additional way to look at a lot of the data that's been collected and to get at um, kind of the point of when there is future development is where are these um, barriers. I had a question about you know hearing Brian talk about uh, accessibility. Uh, last weekend we had the fortunate uh, of having all three grandchildren for eight days, and so I took them to Roslyn, and um, I was well pleased to see a person in a wheelchair being able to get up on certain parts of that park, and I don't know if that's something that you know, we should entertain in the future uh, of having another park, you know, fully accessible or when we do uh, some of our new uh, playgrounds um, to making them accessible. I don't know. I think we had talked about the the cost differential when, when the FRED was done and how much more that would have been, but it was just, I was very happy as were my grandchildren to see that you know, when they see kids their age being able to use the same park, I think we're sending a very strong message and not necessarily just to people that live in our community, but to, you know, the surrounding areas that say, hey, we can take our, our children to Roslyn, you know, and they can enjoy uh, the same facilities that, that other kids can. So I don't know if that's, um, that's just something that, you know, perhaps in our 22, you know, thinking or discussions, we should, uh, particularly since we're going to do some, you know, more playgrounds in the near future, um, you know, just see if that's a possibility. Um, I had one other question. Um, uh, the, the big assumption about if there's progress on the sales tax and, um, you know, the future seems good. I know there were task force that did the Fred and the Braemar Park. So when it comes to doing them, then does the actual distribution of funds to the various items, and is that staff only responsibility at that point? Or do we revisit that from a park commission? Or what's what do you envision the next step would be, assuming that the big step is come to be? I think I'll do my best to answer that tonight with with what the unknown is. Um, I think I, I think there's there's two pieces of this is if the local option sales tax is successful at the legislature, there will come a point in time. Um, not exactly sure when it would be, but if if it's successful where the council would um, authorize and um, approve the, the actual wording for the ballot question. And that will have to happen. I believe there's some statutory guidance around when and how that has to occur. Uh, once that occurs, uh, city staff and, and most of the elected body will, will have to take a informational approach to the question However, there would still remain a need for um, uh, advocacy for that for that initiative. So I think there's there's an opportunity, at, at kind of before and during that process, leading up to a ballot question when when there is a need for advocacy, where city staff would kind of be relegated to an informational only portion. Um, so I think that's one piece of that. The other is the master plans for Braemar and Fred Richards have gone through um, the, the planning phase. The remaining piece of that is design development. And as you've known from other pieces, there is a, a formal phase that that would have to go through. You've went through that with Arden Park, you went through that with the golf course where there are technical natures of that. Um, I think we we want to ensure that the master planning piece of it is still relevant. I think with great confidence, we can say vast majorities of both of those two plans are still relevant. 
However, once we get into the detailed design, we may find that this piece may not work, this may not work. So I think there is a, there's a mechanism and a process that we're gonna have to go through. It's gonna be staff and advisory and elected to say, then this is what we do for that, or we need to revisit this portion of it. I don't think at this point, we wanna go backwards and reopen up a master plan. Like I said, I think they are still good. I think they are still valid, but it would be important to work through design development to get it approved, get a contract on board and then get it built. So there's a, there's a phase of that of design development that would need to occur. Yeah, thank you, that, that uh, makes it a little bit clearer. Thanks, Perry. Um, I didn't have any other, I have a couple uh, comments later on in the next uh, next item, but I'll save them for then. So I don't have any other uh, discussion items for 2022. If anybody else has any, yeah, I've got maybe just a couple thoughts on master okay. plan since Perry brought that up because I I think you you raised a really good point and that's one of my concerns has been that. By the time, I appreciate the way you laid out the, the next steps. I think that makes sense. One of my concerns is in by the time we get there, that someone, whether it's someone who is now embedded in this park community or it's someone on the city council will say, you know, those are pretty stale plans. We ought to redo it. I, th I think some of us that are familiar with having gone through the Fred will recognize that the plan we put together for the Fred was actually the second Fred Richards plan. We had one a number of years ago, and then we got it and did a second one. And so part of my concern is that we get there and somebody says, that's a stale plan. It's now five years old. We need to do another plan. And so I agree with you, Perry, that I hope that we can avoid that as best possible and say, let's deal with Let's deal with incongruencies, if you would, in the detailed design, rather than bringing another consultant in to spend more money to go to another master plan. The, the flip side of that is that by tying both of those master plans to the local option sales tax, the components in there that we thought were valuable, like mountain biking at Braemar, we've now tied them to that plan and in essence pushed them out realistically at least three years. And so that becomes the other concern that says, are we comfortable telling those parts of our community, we can't carve anything out and do that in that master plan, much like was done at Fred Richards with the playground. You know, someone said that playground's important. It's part of the master plan. We have a good reason to do it now. Let's do it. Are we willing to say those other components that people say, well, I'm sorry, that's tied to the local option sales tax we don't want to disrupt the master plan. So therefore, in essence, we push those components out a number of years. And, and I have a concern with that as well. I don't, don't have a good answer to either, but those would be a couple of concerns that I would have us chew on a bit. Let's add some anecdotal feedback on that. Um, I would say when it comes to the Fred Richards master plan, planning around, so the city did its own planning for the park the area to the north, which is highly residential, um, was not expected to change much. The area to the south, however, um, on both sides of the road, on both sides of 77th, is under heavily, heavy consideration for change. And those developers are looking at the Fred Master Plan as relevant and what was almost appro basically approved um, in a master plan level and are using that as guidance for how they are approaching, how they are gonna change. So um, we're having a lot of conversations about, well, we need a temporary connection because in the future we would have one here. We are looking at this from a residential or a hotel or office space and how would that connect to your park existing and once it's built in the future. So I think the, the area that we, that the city knew would change is looking at that plan and saying, we still want it to be relevant and we are guiding towards it. Um, I think the timing is crucial. I, I don't disagree with you on that. I think if from an alternate funding standpoint, if there were other options, I think we could consider what's a priority. I think staff feels the same way with uh, 
for the, the Braemar master plan also includes improvements to the arena. And those aren't um, improvements that we would say, boy, we would like to do those eight years from now. Those are improvements that we would like to do now or two years ago or four years ago. Um, so we also have a concern about that as well. I think it, it all comes back to the, can we have a great plan for alternative funding? Because I think we also need to recognize, recognize too that this is, um, once it goes to a ballot, it's out of our control. Um, it's at the will of the, the residents to vote on increasing a sales tax upon themselves and non-residents that visit the community. So um, while, while we feel they're good plans, I think a lot of people work in them, a lot of people are looking forward to those items. We still have to navigate through that. So either way, I think an alternate plan for funding, which obviously is is in the works, is really crucial as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's good to hear. I know I, I spend some time over at Lone Lake Park and that community to the west of us. Can't think of the name at the moment, but I, I think you're familiar with it. Um, and I used to drive past an empty parking lot next to the tennis courts. And now that parking lot is packed because that's the launching point for their mountain bike trail. And so it just brings back right to the forefront that there's, you know, I'm, I'm sure those aren't all just Minnetonka folks that are there mountain biking, right? It's, it's starting to draw people from a broader range because there's a desire for that. So, you know, it's, it's, if we can figure out some way to get additional alternative funding, it's good to hear that we could look at, well, where, where should we prioritize spending that? As long as we stay within the master plan that's been created, right? Because it's good to hear that's being used and still recognized. Yeah, I think it's important to have a plan A and a plan B to fund it. Because I think the worry I have is if we just carve out one piece of the plan and say, we're only gonna fund this one right now, it really leaves a lot of other folks that vested a lot of time in the plan in a real big unknown. But if there are ways to find alternates to say this would occur with all of these phases, then I think you can look at prioritization. Obviously, it'd be great to do it all at once, but um, yeah, I heard that community also added eight pickleball courts there as well. Yeah, they're um, very busy. Well, that occurred. They're very but, busy. Yeah, but not very good ice. <laughs> no, not very good ice. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, any other uh, comments about 2022? Good discussion uh, about the year to come. So I could uh, Sorry. share this if, if you wanted to get together. Sure. I could curate some of these into maybe some themes for July. Obviously, continued discussion, continued development, and then um, trend towards August with kind of making a decision. Great. That'd be good. Uh, Rick, the, yeah. Rick, the only other two items I had besides the Fred and Bramer, yeah. and it was good to see the comp plan in our deck today, was was maybe to just to spend a little bit of time looking at the comprehensive plan and even all the way back to our strategic plan of a couple of years before that and just see are there any items that bubble up out of that that would be worthwhile to have as specific work items in a 2022 plan. I don't know, to Eileen's point, we may have a couple carryovers already coming out of this plan. Um, so I, I, I know we don't wanna to be too crowded. I think you know this is one where less is more in this case, as opposed to having too many uh, initiatives, but there may be something that bubbles up from one of those two pieces of strategic content that would be good to, to highlight and work on next year. Um, was that two comments or just one, Greg? Probably four, but I'll call it one. Okay. Okay. No, I was just waiting for that. Uh, any other um, comments on the 2022? That'd be helpful, Perry, if you would uh, put those in some type of... Uh, summary and and let us take a look at that uh, would be great anything else director that you'd like to comment about 2022 or 
No, not at this time. Okay. Uh, item number six, uh, member comments. I, I have a couple and then I can, a um, couple of things in the Wall Street Journal this week. Uh, there was an article, front page article about communities struggling with e-bikes that, you know, in some communities, and I think these were in the Southwest states primarily, that the e-bikes were uh, taking over some of the trails, you know, either trails or uh, both with and with out, with and with uh, and outside of the park system. And I was just wondering, um, have we seen any increased traffic on our trails with e-bikes? And um, I ask my son-in-law happens to work for Quality Bike Parks, which is a huge company in Bloomington um, of bike components and stuff. And they can hardly get parts for e-bikes. They're so far backlogged. So that just led me to think about, um, you know, some of our trails. I once in a while I go over to Ohms Lane, so I cross under, you know, the Highway 100 bridge. And I'm just wondering about, you know, congestion or would we have it? Even forward thinking about if if there's a hub over at the Fred, you know, and connecting there with bikes and and um, what our thoughts would be about just not necessarily control e-bikes, but how do we maintain that that flow between um, people that like to use that that as a writing tool and those that are walking or riding bikes? Anecdotally, we've not had a lot of feedback on them yet, with the exception of the regional trail. And I think a lot of e-bike riders are not utilizing smaller neighborhood style parks to ride around. So um, obviously the, the benefit of e-bike is you are pedaling. Um, however, a lot of people view them as the, the hill assist or the distance assist to do that. Um, so you're gonna see a lot more destination or regional style use of an e-bike uh, more often than not. That's gonna cause issues primarily around multi-use trails where they aren't dedicated A for bikers, and B for walkers or joggers. So a lot of the regional trails or distance trails are gonna have that congestion and that issue um, just for the main fact of their, their speed. Um, we do get a lot of speed complaints, I guess you could say, whether it's the, the reality of that piece or the perception of that piece of, you know, a walker going that, you know, three to seven miles per hour and a, even a biker within limits at 12 miles an hour feels, you know, four times as fast, even though they're within the speed limit is just that right, perception right. of them coming by. Um, and a lot of it has to do with with multi use trails um, and social norms around passing or headphones or, you know, all those types of things, congestion. So um, I think, you know, in a lot of a lot of our work, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, hybrid vehicles for our Edina liquor delivery where we would have charging stations at the stores. The Fred Richards may need a bike chart, an e-bike charging station, right? If we we're wanting people to come from a distance, you know, is that an amenity that we would provide? So I think that forward thinking, they are here to stay. Um, they are, um, um, I don't think they're gonna, they're gonna be going anywhere. They, they might be regulated, you know, there might be speed controls that are added or have to be added in the future. I'm sure people will find ways around that, but um, they are, allowing people of all abilities, all ages to get out more and, and not fear that big hill, or am I gonna get tired and come back? So, um, but as you indicated, not only can you not get parts for them, even just purchasing, there's a huge demand for them. Um, mm -hmm. While not um, authorized to operate any Dyna, even some of the nice rides now um, um, to, the, to the east of us in Minneapolis, have an e-bike version of the, the nice ride. So. Yeah, the, the journal article didn't have any conclusion. They just, you know, it's becoming more of a 
more of a problem. Um, my only other comment was I'm going to give a plug to the golf course, not just that I support it, but uh, their youth program started this week, and um, I happen to be over, well, I'm over there almost every day, but there were 1,400 young um, youth in their program, and I made the comment to Jay Meyerhoff, the director of golf. And I congratulated him about one of the largest programs probably in the Midwest. And he said, that's good. It's the 900 kids that are on the waiting list that concerning more. So uh, we have to think about, you know, one of our enterprises that three or four years ago, we didn't know if it was going to survive. Now it has 2,300 kids in a golf youth program. So it's uh, I just wanted to do a shout out to to all the staff that uh, it's kind of neat to see them teaching uh, with the kids that come up to their kneecaps and uh, and having a great both people are having a great time. But uh, that's the only two things I have a comment. So anybody else, uh, please. I would just add on to that, Rick. I think it's great on the, the youth program for golf. I would like to challenge us, and I, um, I've already said this um, um, to Braymar as well, but challenge us to figure out if there's ways that we can um, expand the youth golf beyond just summer. I think I feel like there's opportunities to do more, um, more than just the like day off, and more. Um, I think they do like a schools out program like on Martin Luther King weekend, but I think there's an opportunity to look for um, junior golf leagues or golf lessons using the dome um, and other options for winter or fall or fall. Besides just in the summer, I think there's a big opportunity there. My son particularly, I know we've, I've tried and um, a lot, of, he's actually signed up for a lot of the men's leagues um, and men's lessons because of his ability, but I think there's an opportunity there to expand I mean, you're seeing that many kids on a wait list for summer, and it's not just 2020 because things are open again. So I think there's a big opportunity for kids in golf right now. So I think it, they're doing great, and I just think there's a big opportunity to try to look for other ways to expand that. But that's all I'd say. Any other comments? Uh from uh, commissioners. If not, we can move to item seven, staff comments. Director. Yeah, thank you, Chair Itis. I'll just give you a couple of quick updates here um, from the city council agenda. Page. Um, Assistant Director Peterson, um, in conjunction with her staff at Braemar Arena, submitted a, a grant request um, to the James Metzen's Mighty Ducks to help with the arena project that's currently undertaking. Um, so that application has been filed. And then a quick update, our facilities division is helping, uh, the city's facilities division is helping Braemar Arena staff on a new voice evacuation fire system and we just had a minor change order that needed to occur for that so um, I'll transition into informational items and the one that we didn't have um, in your packet because it wasn't we weren't quite sure what uh, the outcome might be but I wanted to update you for sure this afternoon we did announce that the Edina Aquatic Center will be opening on Friday um, we as you know we had an electrical failure in there that uh, took out the power supply to to the three pools and right as uh, the, the main pool was full and balanced we we had to shut down so um, that delayed us about a week we're um, extremely fortunate our uh, city's facility division has a master electrician on staff he was fantastic to work with helped us troubleshoot that issue um, as you can imagine, um, older equipment and hard to find parts. So a lot of creative but safe um, work was accomplished in there. So we're pleased to uh, state that the, the electrical issue has been resolved. Um, over the weekends, we filled and conditioned and balanced the pools. They um, have passed their inspection. 
because the facility uses LS lifeguarding, all of our, our lifeguards, which also happy to say we have a, a high number of, of guards this year compared to other communities, as you've probably read around the Metro, um, are doing their uh, certification. So they are required to certify at the pool location. So that is occurring this week and we're really looking forward to welcoming our guests back on Friday. Um, we did um, put out some communicate for those season pass holders that had bought um, about the shutdown. We'll be issuing a credit for that. Um, obviously, not anything we wanted to do um, or control, but we did feel it was the right thing to do uh, for our season pass holders to do that. So, um, in addition to um, the electrical piece, um, uh, you'll also notice maybe a, a couple of other items if you venture out at the aquatic center. The pool was uh, recoded, the um, tube slide, the steps were redone, the uh, zip line drop was was redone as well. So there are a number of other improvements that we did uh, undertake while we were shut down last year leading up to this year. So um, we'll be excited to do that. Unfortunately, we did miss um, a lot of hot weather, but um, um, the way the forecast is, it seems like that could be sticking around with us for a while. Um, as you mentioned, the uh, um, chair itis, the Braemar Golf Course, um, we did reopen the dome um, for a several days, so players could take their best approach at the ocean at Kauai Island. That was the course that um, hosted the PGA Championship. That was one of the courses on the Top Tracer Virtual Golf, um, so people had a chance to compete in that. Um, in addition, um, as I mentioned, things are have really picked up um, in the community with our summer programmings and offering. Um, Braemar Arena has kicked off its Learn to Skate program. Centennial Lakes goes into full swing with its uh, summer concerts, children's concerts. Uh, the Farmer's Market, um, a plug for that, will begin on Thursday. And then this Sunday is the annual Parade of Boats. Um, Additionally, the art center camps and our other um, recreation programming and activities at the senior center in full swing. And we did include in your packet um, the, the question that was a, uh, um, brought up at our last commission meeting, the technical wording about um, the tobacco-free parks ordinance for, for our system. We included that in your packet this evening. So that's what I had for informational updates this evening. Um, I have one question about the tobacco policy. Was somebody else talking here? Um, uh, at the golf course, um, I do see cigarette butts frequently and have had the occasion of uh, uh, playing with uh, a person in a different cart that uh, did light up cigarettes frequently. And um, is there, and I can't recall, is there signage when we enter the facility or is there just signage um, in our enterprises or how's somebody to know that without, you know, staff telling them or, um, I mean, and, and, you know, we may know it because we're Edina residents and have been told that, but, uh, you know, many people, I don't know if other communities maybe allow it or, but um, you can you can uh, sure tell it from a distance in a huge open space that uh, somebody is uh, smoking. So I don't, I don't know. I've never seen a sign, you know, like when you enter the clubhouse or, you know, I don't know. And to be honest, I didn't even know until the last meeting that it just didn't occur to me that the golf course Oh, yes, that's part of a park. So I yeah. don't even think mostly Dinah residents know that. So signage would be a good idea. Oh. Yeah, I'd have to review signage. You know, obviously our indoor pieces would fall under the federal clean air uh, act um, of what we have outdoors. Um, but the tricky part is our staff could educate, our staff could remind, our staff could ask for compliance. Um, but because it's an ordinance, we'd have to get the police involved to actually implement this because it is an ordinance or basically a city law. So um, there are 
mechanisms of trying to get compliance. And the first is always education. So, so we can review that piece of it. And I, I, mean, I, I feel like the sign, if we do do signs, should actually kind of point out that it's a city law, not that it's just a, geez, we'd appreciate it if you didn't smoke type of thing. Perry, Perry, do you think it, it's a city ordinance most places? Was it in Minnetonka? It, uh, Travis, it was in Minnetonka. I believe in most places yeah. it is. Um, there was a great education and, and push for tobacco-free parks. Um, boy, Tracy, you have to help me out when that was. Maybe 07, 08, 09, around that time. Um, it was all part of the a vast tobacco settlement that the state attorney general secured at that time. And it provided kind of those resources to cities on the education component and the signage component of it. So um, I do know um, during the recession in a prior community I worked for, a lot of the steel and aluminum signs had been stolen for scrap. Um, kind of like how um, um, people's Cadillac converters are being taken now, but um, so I would imagine we'd have to inventory what is out there. Again, I think part of that that wayfinding and signage program was about regulations. Um, so I think the trouble we have, I think, too, is sign pollution within some of our areas. So whatever we do, maybe it can be wrapped in with that, and it's a little more tasteful and catching and impactful than just a series of signs that, as you walk by, you don't get all the way down with it. Thank you. Um, you're still on board. All right. Um, just a quick piece on your upcoming meetings and events. As indicated, we'll we'll work on a July one, um, which will conclude the second quarter of your work plan progress, um, and that will go informationally to the city council. And then your next meeting is July 13th, and there's a high possibility that that will be some sort of in-person or a hybrid meeting. Um, I know our administration staff is, is working on that option. Um, I think, as I mentioned um, last meeting, if any commissioners had any concerns about that return, to please uh, let me know, and we could kind of work through what accommodations or what, the, what those concerns are for for a return in person, but there's a, a high likelihood that that will occur um, probably fairly quickly. I know the city council wants to go first, um, but I think they are they are uh, trending towards that direction of returning to in person meetings. But we've got a little bit of a break here um, till July 13. Good. If you have concluded, then I'll move to the last item. And I'll ask for a motion and a second for adjournment, and then Janet can do the roll call. So I'll move. Second. I think that was Commissioner Good with the motion and Commissioner Nelson with the second. Yep. Yep. Thank yep. you. All righty. Commissioner Miller. Aye. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Willett. Aye. Commissioner McCauley. Aye. Commissioner Good. Aye. Commissioner Haas. Aye. Commissioner Itis. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good evening. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thanks for breakfast, Eileen. Are you still there? <laughs>